forward. Hello, everybody. It gives me really great pleasure uh, to welcome you to the beginning of our 2023 seminars. And we have the great pleasure of welcoming today Professor Daniela Witten from the University of Washington, where she is Professor of Statistics and Biostatistics and the Dorothy Guilford Endowed Chair in Mathematical Statistics. She has a uh, PhD from Stanford, and she has won a lot of awards along the way. I won't list all of them, but I will note that she was elected as a fellow of the American Statistical Association in, in 2020 uh, and was awarded in, in 2022 um, the COPS uh, <clears throat> Award, which is the Committee of Presidents of Statistical Societies, which is one of the highest honors that can be awarded in statistics. So it's a real pleasure to hear her talk today about uh, uh, <clears throat> double dipping uh, and in uh, single cell work. Uh, she has said that questions along the way would be welcomed. So um, you can either sort of put up your hand and I'll try and keep an eye on that or you can put something in the chat and I'll, uh, I'll also keep an eye on that. So please go ahead. Great, thanks so much um, for the invitation and for the very kind introduction. And I'm really excited to tell you all about some of my work today on um, single cell RNA sequencing, um, data analysis without double dipping. So this is sort of part of a bigger story. And uh, the bigger story is this one, and it has to do with the fact that there's a, a disconnect between what we write in our textbooks and how we actually analyze our data. So what we write in our textbooks and the way we teach our classes is sort of a fiction. Um, we tell people that before ever looking at their data, they should know exactly what hypotheses to test and, and they should stick to that exact pre-specified plan. And the reason that we tell our students to do this and we write this in our textbooks is because this is what is required for the statistical approaches that we use like, like hypothesis tests and confidence intervals in order for those to have the properties that we rely on. Um, but of course, this is a fiction because the world we live in today, um, we are not typically actually pre-specifying all of our hypotheses. Instead, we're looking a bit at our data, and after looking at the data, we're deciding what hypotheses to test. And the issue is that this discrepancy between what we say what we should do, what we say that we should do and what we're actually doing um, causes huge statistical problems, um, as as we're going to see during this talk. So during this talk, I'm going to I'm going to talk about this discrepancy between the fiction and the fact. And then um, particularly how it plays out in the context of single cell RNA sequencing. And then I'll talk about some solutions. So I'm going to refer to this practice of looking at the data in order to decide what hypotheses to test as double dipping. And the idea here is that we're dipping into our data twice, once to decide what hypotheses to test, and then again to test those hypotheses. And so this talk is really about how that double dipping procedure, even though it's very natural, it, it's very problematic, and how can we fix it? So my, my talk today is gonna be motivated by the analysis of single cell RNA sequencing data. Um, and if that's your research interest, then great. And if not though, the ideas that I'll be talking about today are much more general, and we can just think about single cell RNA sequencing as a specific instantiation of the, the problem that I'm talking about and then the set of solutions. So single cell RNA sequencing, um, of course, there's many ways that people analyze the data, but roughly speaking, bird's eye view, there's typically sort of a two-step procedure where in step one, um, and data analysts look for some sort of latent structure in the data. So they might identify the latent structure by clustering. So on the left here, this is a representation of, of single cell RNA sequencing data where each dot represents a cell and then each um, dimension here represents the expression of 20,000 genes projected onto some two-dimensional space. And what they've done on the left here is they've clustered the cells to obtain around, um, I think it's 38 clusters in this example. Another thing that someone might do um, as the, the step one in their single cell RNA sequencing data is to estimate some kind of trajectory. So um, one way that people might do this is, is using a, a set of techniques called pseudotime estimation, where they're trying to understand where the cells represented as dots here live in terms of developmental trajectory. Um, but as a statistician, I'm just going to keep this simple. So in my mind, when I'm thinking about the figure on the right, I'm just imagining that we're just looking at the cells 
projected onto the first two principal components. So again, the, the idea behind step one is you've just done something to your data to identify some kind of latent structure, whether through clustering or principal components analysis or, or whatever specialized technique you might be interested in. And then in step two, the, the typical thing to do is some kind of differential expression analysis, where what we want to do is test whether each gene is associated with this latent structure. And so again, the details of how step one are conducted and how step two is conducted, that's um, very much at the discretion of the data analyst, but a lot of the ways that people analyze single cell RNA sequencing data can be seen as just an instantiation of this pipeline. So here's an example of this pipeline from a paper published in Nature a few years ago. Um, a human liver cell atlas reveals heterogeneity and epithelial progenitors. So they got some single cell RNA sequencing data. I'm showing a heat map of that here. And then they, they clustered the data. So that clustering cartoon I showed on the previous slide was actually from this paper. They got 38 clusters. Again, these are clusters of cells on the basis of gene expression data. And then what they actually did was, was differential expression analysis. As I mentioned, they tested each gene to see if it's differentially expressed across clusters. And actually, they um, released a Shiny app to make it actually super easy to to do this differential expression testing. And so this is a screenshot from that tiny app. I apologize, it's a little bit hard to see um, if it, it might be small on your screen. But um, what you do is you go to their Shiny app and you choose your cluster A. Here I've chosen cluster 11, shown in yellow. And then you can choose cluster B, which is shown in red. I chose that to be cluster 14. Um, and then what you get are a bunch of p-values. So what's going on here? Well, these are p-values for each of the genes in the data. There's, you know. 20,000 or so genes. Um, and it's a p-value for the null hypothesis that the jth gene's expression is equal between clusters 11 and 14. And as we can see from this results table on the right, the um, p-values tend to be quite small for, for the genes shown. OK, so this is, again, this is an example of, of how this sort of two-step pipeline is carried out in this particular nature paper. But again, this is a pretty common type of analysis. So we can think about the p-values that are being reported by the software, and we can wonder whether these p-values are valid. So this is the, um, the function that is being used in order to compute these p-values. It's from a, a very popular software package called Surratt, um, where here I'm showing a screenshot showing that the Surratt paper has been cited 4,000 times, but actually I probably took that screenshot two years ago. So I'm sure the number of citations for Surratt is quite a bit higher now. And if we look at the details of this, this function that finds uh, differentially expressed genes, we see the sentence that I have underlined, which is that p-values should be interpreted cautiously as the genes used for clustering are the same genes tested for differential expression. Hmm. So that's actually exactly what I was referring to double as double dipping earlier, um, where they're using the data twice, first to generate a hypothesis, in other words, to obtain clusters, and then to test the hypothesis and compute p-values. So um, we, we have a sense that there may be a problem with these p-values. Um, and indeed, we can see, again, the authors of the software say that the p-values should be interpreted cautiously, um, which is maybe like a polite way of saying that they're aware of a problem. And we'll, we'll talk about more about that problem in a few minutes. Uh, before I go on from the slide, I just want to mention, this isn't like a problem that's specific to this particular software package. Like if you analyze this type of data, I don't want the take home here to be, you know, I shouldn't use Surratt, I should use something else. This is actually just kind of like a fundamental problem and it doesn't matter what software package you use because there's an unsolved statistical problem at play here that we need to solve. So like, let's not blame the software, let's instead develop statistical methods to address this problem. Okay, but before we develop a whole bunch of statistical methods to solve a problem, we should understand sort of how pervasive the problem is. So is, is double dipping something that these people did in this nature paper once, or is it something that comes up a lot? Um, and sort of to answer that, I'm going to just show you some snippets from a, a review article that was published in Genome Biology in 2020, where these authors um, wrote about the 11 grand challenges in single cell data science. And across all of single cell data science, they identified as one of their challenges the need to define flexible statistical frameworks for discovering complex differential patterns in gene expression. So they're kind of describing, you know, like step two of that, that two-step procedure I was describing. And if we read the text, they say that the issue is that current analysis pipelines 
rely on clustering to identify groups before downstream differential analysis is performed. And here's the really important part, without accounting for the double use of data, and by double use of data, they mean clustering and differential testing between clusters. So in other words, this double dipping issue, it's not, it's, it's a problem. And it's not just like kind of a obscure problem that a statistician is worrying about that maybe you don't need to worry about. Um, this is this is a real problem and it's it's going to cause a lot of issues in your data analysis if, if we don't um, address it correctly. So before I go on, I know this is sort of a diverse audience of um, people with a lot of different interests. So we're going to have a little quick reminder on what is a p-value. So what is a p-value? A p-value tells us the probability of seeing such an extreme result under the null hypothesis. So if the null hypothesis is true, like what are the chances of just seeing something so extreme, such a big difference between the expression of the genes and the two clusters, for example. And there's sort of one key property that makes a p-value a p-value, and I'm going to call this my need to have property. And the need to have property is that if the null hypothesis holds, then the p-value is uniformly distributed between zero and one. In other words, if the null hypothesis is true, my p-value is equally likely to take a value of 0.1 or 0.5 or 0.99999. There's also a nice to have property. And my nice to have property is that if the p-value doesn't hold, I'm sorry, I misspoke. My nice to have property is that if the null hypothesis doesn't hold, then my p-value is going to be small. And the reason that's nice to have is because we would like to reject the null hypothesis when the p-value is small. So when I say that the first property is a need to have property, what I mean is that if this doesn't hold, it's literally not a p-value. Like if you tell me something's a p-value, but it's not uniformly distributed between zero and one under the null hypothesis, then sorry, bud, it's not a p-value. And it's just statisticians would refer to this as type one error control. Um, now this nice to have on the other hand, we would like this to hold because if it doesn't hold, then the p-value is not useful because the whole point of a p-value is that I want to reject the null hypothesis when it's small. So I really would like it to be small when the null hypothesis doesn't hold. Um, and this is what statisticians refer to as power. But again, power is a nice to have. The need to have is for my p-value to be uniformly distributed under the null hypothesis. OK, now just a, a brief note on um, some of you might be like, oh, OK, well, this talk isn't relevant to me because I would never use a p-value. Maybe you're thinking, well, you would you would only ever report a confidence interval. You'd never report a p-value. OK, so all the things I'm talking about in this talk, they apply exactly the same way to confidence intervals as they do to p-values. So like, for example, I'm going to give some examples in a minute of, of what goes wrong with double dipping. And I'll be reporting p-values, and you'll see that there's a problem. If instead I reported confidence intervals, we'd have the exact same problem. So you are not going to get out of this double dipping problem by by using like confidence intervals instead. And maybe you're like, well, you know, like I'm I don't believe in frequent frequented statistics. I'm I'm a Bayesian. You're still not getting out of this problem. This is kind of like a fundamental problem. Um, and the issue here is not the use of p-values or, or null hypothesis significance testing. This is just a fundamental issue. It doesn't matter how we how we report our results using p-values or something else, we need to address the underlying issue here, which is double dipping. Okay, so I, I know I really uh, buried the lead here, so let's now say what goes wrong with double dipping. So to kind of illustrate the issue, I'm going to just simulate some data. And you can think about this as just a simulation where I've, I've sampled 100 cells. And th these cells are in two dimensions. So you can think about one axis here as being gene one, the other axis as being gene two. So this is the data. It's 100 cells with respect to two genes, and they're independent, identically distributed from just like a noise model. So there are no clusters here. There is no signal. This is just noise. But I'm going to cluster the cells because clustering is something that I can always do to my data. There may or may not be real clusters, but I can always like apply, for example, hierarchical clustering to my data and just see what I get. And so that's what I've done here. And I have three clusters shown in green, blue, and red, green, blue, and orange. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute a p-value for a difference in means between each pair of clusters. So like I'm going to test the null hypothesis that the mean of the blue cluster equals the mean of the green cluster. And I'm going to test that null hypothesis just using like a, just a standard test for a difference in means. Like a, imagine using like a two sample t test, for example. And if I do that, then all of my p-values are going to be less than 10 to the negative 7. And there's 
there's three p-values here because I can compare blue to green, green to orange, and orange to blue. And all of those p-values are going to be really, really small. So I have this, this scary face. And why is the face scared? Well, the face is scared because I know in my heart that there's no true clusters in this data, right? Because in step one, I generated this data from just like a noise model. There's no true clusters. So I, I know in my heart that in step three, I really shouldn't have rejected the null hypothesis. Like the null hypothesis is that, is that there's no difference in means between the clusters beyond what we'd expect by chance. And so I know that my P, I know the null hypothesis should hold. So I think my p-values should be uniformly distributed between zero and one, because under the null hypothesis, the thing that makes a p-value a p-value is that it's uniform zero one. But here, all my p-values are 10 to the negative seven. That sure doesn't look like they're uniform zero one. So it, it seems like there's a problem here. And indeed there is a problem, which is I use the data twice, once to identify the clusters. So in other words, to generate the hypothesis that I'm gonna test and then again to calculate the p-values. Okay, so I'm a big believer that if there's a simple solution, you should take that instead of coming up with a complicated solution. And so often when you're faced with double dipping type problems in statistics, uh, there's a really simple way to solve that problem using sample splitting. So now we're gonna check if we can solve this double dipping problem for clustering using sample splitting. And in particular here, the samples are the cells. So I'm gonna to refer to this as cell splitting. So we're gonna just simulate some data and we're gonna see if we can use sample splitting or cell splitting to, to address the double dipping problem. So on the left, I'm generating again, null data, just like cells um, just from like a noise model, absolutely no clusters on the left. That's what I'm calling null data because there's no clusters. And then I'm just at random splitting the cells into a training set and a test set. Then I'm going to cluster the training set into this time an orange and a green cluster. And now I'm going to apply those cluster labels to the test set. But notice that like my clustering on the training set, it didn't quite tell me what cluster each test set observation should belong to. So I need some way to like decide if each test set observation should be orange or green. And the way I'm going to do that in this particular example is using three nearest neighbors classification, where for each observation in the test set, I'm just gonna find it's three nearest neighbors in the training set. And if it's three nearest neighbors are mostly orange, then I'll color it orange. And if it's three nearest neighbors are mostly green, I'll color it green. So the exact decision to do three nearest neighbors classification here was really not important in the sense that if I had done something else besides three nearest neighbors classification, the, the results I'm gonna show you in a moment would still hold. Okay, so now I have orange and green clusters on the test set, and I can test for a difference in means on the test set between the orange and the green clusters. And when I do that, I get a p-value that's really small. It's uh, less than 10 to the negative five. Okay, so what happened here? Well, first of all, the bottom line is that this p-value is too small. Again, I know in my heart that the null hypothesis holds. So I know in my heart that the p-value, if it's gonna be like a valid p-value, it should be uniform between zero and one. And I don't believe that 10 to the negative five is uniformly distributed between zero and one. So what went wrong? Um, well, what went wrong here was really in step three. In step three, I needed a way to decide whether each test observation should be colored orange or green. And the way that I did that actually made use of the test data because like to decide whether, you know, a particular triangle should be colored orange or green, I, I looked at the position of that triangle in the test data in order to find its nearest neighbors in the training data. And the act of looking at the position of a triangle in the test data to find its, its, its neighbors in the training data, that amounted to using the data once, and then I used it again to test the hypothesis. So, so on a fundamental level, sort of no matter exactly how you carry out step three, the step three that you carry out is going to involve the test set data, and you're gonna end up using the test set data twice, once in step three and once in step four and you're gonna end up with p-values that are not valid. Even though it seems like we split the data into a training and a test set, we still have ended up using our test data twice. So this, this point, um, this is a little bit subtle. I actually, when I um, first saw this, uh, a former grad student of mine, Lucy Gao, who's now faculty at University of British Columbia, she came and she showed me this and I actually didn't believe her. I was like, Lucy, like, you know, sample splitting always works. 
um, to solve double dipping. And she sort of had to walk me through this example very carefully to convince me of the issue. But the bottom line here is that there's not a simple fix here using sample splitting. We need to be more clever. Okay. So now just outline for what's going to come in this talk. Uh, part one, I'm going to talk about a selective inference approach for clustering. And you can think about this as a bespoke or a customized approach that's tailored to the data analysis procedure. Where if you tell me exactly how you're going to do your data analysis, like exactly how you'll do clustering, exactly how you'll do downstream hypothesis testing, um, and you give me a smart grad student, then we can come back to you in 12 to 24 months with a solution. But you got to be able to tell me exactly how you're going to define those clusters and exactly how you're going to test them. And then in part two, we're instead going to propose something that's quite different, which is a one size fits all approach that works for any data analysis procedure where I don't care how you define your clusters. I don't care how you test them as long as we're willing to make an assumption about your data, which I'll talk about when we get to part two, we have a one size fits all approach for you. Okay, so first I'll talk about selective inference for clustering. And again, just to, to clarify the problem, uh, what we're doing is we have some data, we perform clustering, let's say hierarchical clustering on it. So the middle shows a, a dendrogram, which is a graphical representation of a hierarchical clustering to get the clusters shown on the right. And what we wanna answer is the question of whether the cluster means are really different. Okay, so I'm going to phrase this question more statistically. I have like two slides of math in this entire talk, and this is one of the two. May, I don't know, maybe it's four slides of math, but I promise it's not a lot. Um, but just to phrase things a little more precisely, we have a data set X um, with N cells and Q genes. And we're going to assume that the I throw of X is drawn from a normal distribution with um, a mean mu I, which is a length Q vector, and then a covariance, which is sigma squared times the identity, where sigma squared is some known variance. And I just want to mention briefly, in this talk, just to keep the math as simple as possible, I'm assuming that the um, covariance is sigma squared times the identity. But in practice, we would probably want to not make the assumption that the covariance is a multiple of the identity. And that would be totally fine, um, just that we would have like a little bit more notation floating around that I didn't want to have to use. Okay, so now we're gonna cluster the data to get C1 hat through CK hat, where C1 hat is a set of indices of the observations in the first cluster. So like if the third, ninth, and eighth observations are in the first cluster, then C1 hat is three, nine, and eight, and, and so on for all the other clusters. So we have capital K clusters. Um, and then we're gonna let mu bar CK hat be the mean associated with the kth cluster. So in other words, we're gonna just take the observations that I've decided belong to the case cluster, and we're just going to average their mu i's. And the, the question we want to ask is, can we test the null hypothesis that the mean in the case cluster is equal to the mean in the k prime cluster? So a really important thing to notice here is that this question is really weird. And the thing that's sort of weird about it statistically is that usually when we test a null hypothesis, the null hypothesis is a function of unknown. It involves unknown parameters. Um, so in, in statistics, we usually use Greek letters to denote unknown parameters. So like mu sub i is a parameter. But the thing that's weird about this null hypothesis is, is it involves mu bar c hat k. And mu bar c hat k doesn't just involve the mu i's, which are the parameters. Mu bar c hat k also involves the data because c k hat was a function of the data. So this is a very weird null hypothesis that, that actually involves the data by way of c k hat and c hat k prime. And, and that's really the issue here is that the null hypothesis that we're testing is generated from the data. You can directly see that by seeing that there's a C hat K and a C hat K prime in the null hypothesis. But for a moment, let's just suspend disbelief and let's just like power through. Let's just pretend that we didn't notice that this null hypothesis was weird. So if we didn't notice that this null hypothesis was weird, we could take a very naive approach where our p-value would just be defined as the probability under the null hypothesis of seeing as big of a difference between the mean in the kth cluster and the mean in the k prime cluster by chance as what we saw. So this is just like the standard naive p-value. This is like what a, a two sample t-test does. Um, but as, as we saw in simulation before, this is not a good idea. This does not give us a valid p-value um, because even when the null hypothesis should hold because we know that there's no true clusters, 
um, this p-value is not uniformly distributed. And, and the way we phrase that statistically is that we don't get selective type 1 error control. So the, the issue here is that we somehow need our p-value to account for the fact that the clusters were estimated on the data. And the intuition is that if we hadn't estimated CXK and CXK prime as clusters on this data, we wouldn't have tested this null hypothesis. So we need to compute a p-value that accounts for the fact that we got these clusters on our data. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to calculate the probability under the null hypothesis of seeing as big of a difference between the clusters as what we saw, given that clustering our data gave us these two clusters. So instead of thinking about like the full universe of possible data sets that we could have under the null hypothesis, we're going to limit ourselves to the subset of that universe such that clustering the data gives us the two clusters that we got. Because if we hadn't gotten those two clusters, we wouldn't have actually tested this null hypothesis. So very briefly, this selective p-value that is conditioning on the fact that we got these clusters, it controls the type 1 error. In other words, it's a valid p-value. Um, it, it turns out that figuring out how to compute this p-value is quite hard, and it's the that's the thing that would take my grad student and me 12 to 24 months if you asked us to do this for, for your particular problem. Um, but the good news is that we've done that, and, and I'm not going to get into all the details. Instead, I'm just going to show you some results. Um, so the results that I'll show you are going to be on, on single-cell RNA sequencing data. This was a paper published a few years ago um, consisting of, of single-cell expression for T cells, B cells, and monocytes. So in our analysis, first we took 600 T cells, and these are all T cells. So I'm not an immunologist, but they're T cells. So I believe there probably are not like really important and big clusters in this data. So I'm going to call it like the no clusters data where I'm putting no clusters in air quotes because, you know, I'm sure there's heterogeneity in real life between T cells, but big picture to me as a statistician, bird's eye view, they're all T cells. Okay, now I'm also going to subsample 200 B cells, T cells, and monocytes, and I'm going to call this a clusters data set because I believe there's real clusters in this data. I believe that the B cells, the T cells, and the monocytes all have quite different gene expression. I'm going to pre-process the data. And then I mentioned earlier that like the, the couple of equations that I showed before um, assume that the covariance of the data was a multiple of the identity, and that wouldn't be a good assumption here. So I'm not going to make that assumption. Instead, I'm going to estimate a full covariance matrix. All right. So now I'm going to cluster the T cells. And if I cluster the T cells, um, first I can take the naive approach where I don't account for the fact that the clusters were estimated from the data. And I can test for a difference in expression between the three estimated clusters. And if I do that, I get p-values that are quite small. They're all smaller than 0.001. And that is because um, the naive p-values do not account for the fact that the clusters were all estimated from the data. So in other words, those na naive PBLs have double dipped. Remember, I don't think that there's true clusters here because in my opinion, these are all T cells. So I'm suspicious that those naive P values are small only because we double dipped on the data. Um, but I can also compute our P values, which are um, the ones that we get if we take this approach where we condition on the fact that um, we got these clusters from the data. So those P values will actually account for the fact that we did double dipping. And those p-values are around 0.7, which is something that would not cause me to reject the null hypothesis because a, a p-value of 0.7 suggests that there's really no strong evidence against the null hypothesis. So this is a case where I prefer my, my selective p-values that account for double dipping because they will cause me to not reject the null hypothesis of no clusters in this data, which again makes sense because here these are all T-cells. Okay. Well, now I'm going to look at the data that consists of T cells, B cells, and monocytes, where I do believe in my heart that there are true clusters. Um, I'm again going to cluster the data to get three clusters. This is the projection of the data onto the first two principal components. Um, the naive p values that don't account for the fact that I clustered the data in order to get the null hypothesis, um, those p values are all around 0.001. But what's really interesting is that my selective p values that do account for the fact that the clusters were estimated from the data are also around 0.001. In fact, my p-values are almost indistingu indistinguishable from the naive p-values. Even though my p-values control the type 1 error, in other words, my p-values are valid p-values. Daniela, there's a question from one yeah. of the students, from Julia Mullet. 
Yeah, no, I, I just have a good question. So, so like, I understand a statistical framework that you're trying to establish to as objectively separate these groups as you can, but I, I do feel like there's still a certain amount of subjectivity that's involved in like identifying, you know, whether these clusters are truly separate. Do you, like, I, I guess, how do you find a balance in, you know, defining these populations given, given that? Yeah, so that's a great question, and I but I want to make sure that I understand it. So you said um, there's a, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact words, but you said that there's an art in defining whether the clusters are really separate. Are you referring to like the clustering that I did that gave me these three colors? Or are you referring to the way that the p-values are computed? Or are you referring to the fact that in my opinion, when I have T-cells, B-cells, and monocytes, I think that there should be true clusters there? Like, I'm not sure which part you're referring to. I think it's the last part. So saying they're true clusters. So like, uh, oh. I think there was a nature genetics paper published yeah. last year that they separated different CD4 T cell populations. And, you know, while the statistical methods are are good at separating them, I, I still feel like there, there's probably some overlap that has the potential to bias results. Yeah, that's so listen, that is a great point. I, I'm, I would love it actually if offline you could send me that paper because I think that'll tie into this narrative just based on the description you just gave, because the narrative here is that these are just T cells. I mean, again, not an expert on memory T cells, like at all, like understatement of the year, but I am an expert in statistics. And what I know is that if you apply this sort of naive procedure that doesn't account for double dipping, you are going to find that there are distinct populations of T cells when actually they're not because you have double dipped on your data. So, so the, the thing that I believe you just described, which is a situation where researchers found distinct populations of T cells, that's very consistent with the story here, which is that if you do double dipping, you're always going to find that your populations are different because it's just like by nature of the fact that you've used the data twice. Whereas, you know, whether or not they're true clusters, you're always going to find that your p values are small. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. And I'll, I'll, I'll email you the paper and I'll, 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 also ask for I'll also ask for additional publications so I can build my own knowledge. Yeah, that would be great. The, uh, yeah, I'd love to see the paper. The other thing that I just want to mention also is like, I think one aspect of your question maybe is like, well, how do I know that there's no true clusters here? And the answer is like, I absolutely don't. Because like, you know, number one, I'm a statistician or number two, I don't think we know. And then number three, we can get into a whole philosophical question about like, what is a cluster? Because you know, bird's eye view, all the cells are the same, zoom in and up and each cell is different. So in a sense, like the idea of whether there are clusters almost becomes philosophical. But I think that in order to make the question concrete, what we need to ask something a little bit more precise, which is like, is there evidence based in our data of more of a difference than you'd expect under a null model? And that's a very concrete question we can answer. And for the case of just T cells, I believe the answer to that question is no, based on our valid inference approach. And the issue is that like a invalid approach that just does like a plain vanilla t-test like you'd get if you didn't think about double dipping will get the wrong result um okay so but that, thanks that's a great question and I I also just want to mention if anyone has questions like I don't have an agenda here so if I if we get sidetracked a little bit on a question that's fine but in the meantime while, while waiting for other people to think of questions um I'm going to go on to part two of my talk which is solving the same problem, which is, you know, we have an issue where we're clustering our data and then we're gonna do a hypothesis test and we wanna somehow overcome this double dipping issue, but it's, it's gonna take a, a super different approach. So actually, before I go into that super different approach though, I wanna explain what the problem was with the approach in part one. So the approach in part one, it falls into this framework called selective inference um, that's been really, um, really popular in statistics in the last 10 years. And the idea behind selective inference is like, you can double dip your data, like it's fine. However, you need to tell me exactly how you're gonna do that double dipping. And I'm gonna come up with a procedure that allows me to condition on the way that you got the hypothesis so that the p-value will be valid. So like going back to the definition of the p-value that I used, remember I was conditioning on the fact that the data gave me these two particular clusters. So in order to do that, I need to know exactly how you're gonna get those clusters. Like you gotta tell me you're gonna do hierarchical clustering, you're going to use this type of linkage. You're going to use this type of dissimilarity. And then if I haven't already written on a paper about it, I need 12 to 24 months to like work out the math. And again, all that math, it didn't go in this talk, but, but there's a lot of math behind it. Um, so this is not a practical solution. And the reason it's not a practical solution is that anyone who works in this field knows that there's tons of methods for single cell RNA sequencing data analysis. 
you know, depending on whether you want to do clustering or trajectory inference or something else. But furthermore, even if you're doing clustering, like most people are not actually doing hierarchical clustering. They're doing something that is like much, much, much more, you know, sort of like specific and complicated and maybe heuristic. And chances are, even if you give me 12 to 24 months, I'm not going to be able to, you know, come up with the, the, the correct selective inference approach because it might be that, that what you're doing is actually too complicated. And furthermore, you might not be willing to give me 12 to 24 months. Like you might not be willing to specify your exact analysis plan and then wait to 12 to 24 months and then you might not even get results you like. So there's kind of a fundamental disconnect with like selective inference as a solution versus double dipping for single cell RNA sequencing data as a problem. Um, and then, so because the issue here is we're not gonna be able to develop a bespoke selective inference solution for each data analysis approach. And then there's an additional issue too, which is that actually in order for like the math behind the selective inference type of approach that I've talked about to work, we actually need the data to be multivariate normal, which is not quite a reasonable assumption. But I think the main issue here is really bullet points one and two, more so than bullet point three. So, so is there a different way we can solve this problem that doesn't go through the selective inference framework? And in order to come up with another approach, we're going to revisit cell splitting. So remember earlier, I showed you these results showing that cell splitting, which is the idea of just splitting our cells and training in a test set, doesn't work in the context of clustering. It also doesn't work for trajectory inference. In general, it doesn't work for unsupervised types of analyses where you are just trying to like learn a latent structure in your data. Um, but, but the question that we have is, okay, so cell splitting doesn't work. All right, we've established that. But is there a way we can tweak it? Is there so, is there a way we can do something that's kind of like cell splitting, but not quite the same in order to perform valid inference after double dipping? And the way we're gonna do that is by thinking a little bit about what our data looks like here. So for single cell RNA sequencing data, you know, thus far I've just been kind of like waving my hands and not talking about the structure of the data, but it actually has a very specific structure where we can think about having cells on the rows lots of cells, so lots of rows, and then genes on the columns, and again, lots of columns. And the, the numbers in this matrix are actually counts, so we can think about them like very big picture as like the number of times a transcript associated with the, the, this gene was observed in this cell, so it's going to be a non-negative count. So we're going to propose a new procedure called count splitting, and the idea behind this new procedure is as follows. We have our, our single cell RNA sequencing data, which here in this cartoon is just a four by three matrix, just so that it fits nicely onto the slide. And I'm gonna refer to a particular element of it as XIJ. So like the, the second row and the third column, second cell and third gene, that would be X23. So in this particular one, X23 is five. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new matrix. And the way I'm gonna get this new matrix is by sampling from a binomial distribution where the number of counts in the binomial distribution or the number of draws in my binomial distribution is gonna be xij. And each draw is gonna have probability epsilon where epsilon is a number between zero and one. So this is gonna give me a training data matrix that I'm gonna call x train. And again, the way that I get x train, like if I look at the number two in, in blue in the, in the top right, the way that I got that two was that I drew from a binomial distribution with parameter five comma epsilon, where epsilon is let's say one half or something. So each element of this training matrix on the top right, I'm getting it by drawing from a binomial with the number of draws given in the, in the original data matrix. And then I'm gonna compute a test set. And the way that I get the test set is I just take my original data X and I subtract out the training data. So my training data, my test data sum to the original data. And I can see that if I just look at this example, like three plus two sums to five, 12 plus 11 sums to 23 and so on. Okay, and I'm gonna refer to this procedure as count splitting, where again, epsilon is just a number between zero and one that I get to specify. And for simplicity, we can just think of epsilon as being one half. Okay, so what, what is the point of this? Well, what is the key result? Um, well, if I assume that my training data, or rather if I draw training data that's that's binomial from X with probability epsilon, like epsilon equals one half, and then I take my test data to be X minus X train, then there's a really important result. And the result says that if my original data is Poisson, 
um, with some parameter lambda. So if xij, the ij element of x is Poisson with some parameter lambda ij, then my training data will also be Poisson. My test data will be Poisson. And the, the Poisson parameters for my training and my test data are going to be the same as the Poisson parameter for the original data, but scaled by either epsilon or one minus epsilon. And furthermore, my training and my test data are independent. So in other words, this count splitting procedure, if I believe that my data is down, drawn from a Poisson distribution, then count splitting gives me a way to get a training set and a test set that have the same dimension as my original data. And furthermore, they have the same mean as the original data up to scaling by a constant epsilon, like a constant one half. I should mention, this is actually a very well-known result. So this is not due to us. This is um, referred to as binomial thinning and it, it's a very old result in probability theory that like a, um, a grad student in statistics or biostatistics might prove during their first year. Okay, so why is this helpful? Why would I wanna do count splitting? Well, the point is, I now have a training test and a test set that are independent and they both look like the original data in the sense that they have the correct mean up to scaling by an unimportant constant. So now I have a way that I can kind of have two copies of X, but they're independent, so I haven't double dipped. So in other words, I can use the training data to estimate latent variables, like to perform clustering or to estimate an underlying trajectory. And then I can use the test data to conduct inference, like to test a null hypothesis. And because the training set and the test set are independent, I haven't double dipped. In other words, I have type one error control. So what's incredibly important here is that this pipeline is agnostic to the latent variable estimation that we've performed. And it's also agnostic to the hypothesis testing that we've done. So I literally don't care how you're gonna analyze your data. Like you give me your single cell RNA sequencing data. I'm gonna split it into a training set and a test set. I'm gonna tell you, knock yourself out on the training set, do literally whatever you want, like fit it hard, identify all the clusters, just whatever you'd like to do, I don't care. And then just test your hypotheses on the test data and we're good. You haven't double dipped, your p-values are valid. Okay, so we, we can ask whether this really works and, and maybe briefly since I'm somehow a little bit short on time, uh, this is a QQ plot. Um, where we have generated p-values in a simulation where there is no true signal. So I know that the null hypothesis holds. I'd like to see p-values that are perfectly uniform, zero, one. And in this type of plot, p-values that are on the diagonal are uniform, zero, one. And p-values below the diagonal are too small. And so I can see the count splitting gives me these beautiful p-values that are perfectly on the diagonal shown in red, whereas cell splitting or the naive approach that just straight up double dips um, gives me p-values that are too small. So this is just like a good sanity check that we've controlled the selective type one error. In other words, we've gotten valid p-values. Okay, so this whole thing, it made one assumption, but a critically important assumption, which is that my single cell RNA sequencing data has a Poisson distribution. Because if that holds, then my training and test set are independent. And if not, then we'll talk about that in a minute. But the first thing we can ask is, is it reasonable to model single cell RNA sequencing data as Poisson? And so the first thing I'll tell you is that this assumption is definitely reasonable. Um, here's a paper that came out recent, relatively recently in PNAS um, arguing that a Poisson distribution is the way to go for single cell RNA sequencing. Um, here's a, a paper in genome biology also arguing in support of using a Poisson distribution. Uh, here's another one published in 2021, Nature Genetics, arguing that we should be modeling single cell RNA sequencing data using a Poisson distribution. So of course, like, Maybe we shouldn't be surprised that if I look online, I'm able to find papers that support the assumption of Poisson distribution. Just because there's papers that say that single cell RNA sequencing is Poisson distributed, um, that may or may not provide you with reassurance. So in case you're a worrier like I am, we can wonder, well, what happens if we perform this count splitting procedure, but the Poisson assumption doesn't hold? Well, first of all, what would go wrong? The thing that would go wrong is that the training and the test set would not be independent. So we wouldn't actually control the type one error by performing count splitting. And we can wonder, well, how bad the problem, how bad would the problem be? And we can actually say, well, suppose the data is not Poisson distributed. Usually if people don't believe that their single cell RNA sequencing data is Poisson distributed, then they instead assume that it's negative binomial, which is sort of like a, a noisier version of the Poisson. And in that case, we actually have a formula that we can write down that allows us to quantify 
the correlation between the training and the test set. So for me as a statistician, I like to know that if there's a problem, I can like work out the math for how bad the problem is. And so this is nice because I literally have an equation that tells me how bad the problem is. Like, you know, if I, my data is not plus on, this is exactly how bad the issue is going to be. But the only thing better than um, identifying a problem is fixing it. So we can also ask about what happens if, if we actually try to fix this problem. Is there a way we can extend our account splitting procedure to allow for non Poisson data? And um, so everything that I've talked about so far is like published work or in press. And what I'm gonna talk about now is a paper that's actually not quite out yet, but we'll be releasing the preprint really soon, hopefully. And this is a new procedure called negative binomial account splitting. So this is gonna look a lot like the count splitting that I showed you before for Poisson data, but it's gonna be slightly different. Where again, I'm gonna call a particular element of my data matrix XIJ. But now instead of getting a training data set by drawing from a binomial, I'm gonna draw my training data from a beta binomial distribution where the beta binomial is just a statistical distribution that's kind of obscure. To be quite honest, I haven't used it very much in my career, but uh, this is a place that it turned out it was nice to use it. Where here B is, is the overdispersion parameter of the negative binomial distribution. My test data is once again going to be X minus X train. Why on earth would I do this? Like literally why? Um, who, who even came up with this? Uh, it seems like such a bizarre thing to do. Well, it turns out that there's a really key result. And this key result says that if my if I do this procedure where I take my training data to be beta binomial from my original data, and if I take my test data to be X minus X train, then under the assumption that my original data is negative binomial, then I get this beautiful result that's an exact analog to the Poisson count splitting result we had, which says that the training data is going to be negative binomial with the same mean as the original data up to scaling by a constant epsilon. The test data is again going to be negative binomial with the same mean as the original data, but scaled by one minus epsilon, and my training and my test data set are going to be independent. Um, and just in case you're like a, a big fan of the negative binomial distribution, it can be parameterized in a bunch of different ways. And this is the way that I parameterized it on this slide. So I had mentioned that like the math that went into this result for Poisson count splitting was um, very well known and that a first year grad student might have proved it in a stat class. Um, this is not well known. Actually, when we worked out this result, I could not find it in the literature. I was literally convinced that even though the proof was so simple, I was convinced we must have made a mistake because it felt like if this were true, then it would be something that like, you know, you'd be having your first year grad students proof. I emailed all the very senior faculty in my department who I thought might know this type of thing. No one had seen it. And we actually ended up finding a reference for this in, in some like pretty old literature on, on time series data, which is really not, not directly related to this at all. Um, so this is a really cool result that as far as I know is not well known and it gives us exactly what we need here in order to avoid double dipping on negative binomial data. Great, and, and so again, I mean, this, this result, sorry to use the silly emoji, but that's how I felt when my, my grad student, um, Anna Neufeld came to me with this. So finally, I'm just about out of time, but just very briefly, I wanna show an application to some data. Um, so this is, um, a data set collected by, or rather a paper published by our collaborators at Hopkins, um, Alex, Alexis Battle and, and her student Joshua Pop, as well as others. Um, and so here's a figure from their paper where they are looking at cells. So these are cells projected into um, first two dimensions of UMAP using UMAP. Um, and this is differentiation data. So the colors here represent days of differentiation of the cells from zero to 15. Um, so I'm a statistician, which means I don't like UMAP, and instead I'm gonna show you just like my version of this data, which is using principal components. So this is just like the UMAP figure from their paper, but I projected on the first two principal components instead. And the colors I'm using are a bit different, but the point is you can see that the first principal component really tells me like which day of differentiation these cardiomyocytes are in. So the first thing that we can do is we can ask, okay, well, which genes are associated with the first principal component? So like our step one here was to estimate the first principal component and our step two is gonna be test to see if any genes are associated with that principal component. 
And here I'm doing, I'm answering that question using naive p-values on the x-axis. So p-values, the double dip, I'm sorry, naive p-values, the double dip on the y-axis and my count splitting p-values that avoid double dipping by using a training and a test set are shown on the x-axis. And what I see right away is that the count splitting p-values are, are bigger than the naive p-values, which is a bummer because we'd like our p-values to be small. But on the other hand, if I actually pay attention, I see that what's really happening is that a p-value of 10 to the negative 13 using the double dipping naive approach becomes a p-value of 10 to the negative nine using my approach. So there's really not a substantive difference between the p-values. Like when I perform count splitting, the p-values that should be small are still really small because we're not gonna do any different decision-making in terms of the results we present based on whether a p-value is 10 to the negative nine or 10 to the negative 13. And I can also compute a different version of the naive p-values that use only the test data. And if I do that, then I see that count splitting p-values and naive p-values are really the same. So what that means is that the only reason that the naive p-values are smaller is because they use more data because they didn't bother to split into training versus test set. So this makes sense. The point is if I look for genes that are associated with the first principal component, then I find a lot of genes that are associated with the first principal component, regardless of whether or not I account for double dipping. And that makes sense because again, if we look at the data, we can see that the first principal component is very, it really is containing signal. And I know that because it's associated with day zero through day 15. Okay, and now what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna say, well, what if I just take the day zero data and I regress out both phase and cell type, and then I project that onto the first two principal components. Well, this data, it should have nothing here. Like this is just, in my opinion, this should just be noise because I'm just looking at day zero. So that there's no differentiation yet. And I've removed kind of all the covariates that I can possibly remove. And so I believe that there's like no signal on this first principal component and that all the p-values should just be uniform zero one for all the genes. And if I do that, and here I'm showing you a QQ plot, um, which is representing sort of whether or not the p-values have a uniform zero one distribution. And I'd like to see p-values that fall on the 45 degree line because I think that the null hypothesis holds. And if I do that, then my count splitting procedure gives me these beautiful p-values right on the 45 degree line, indicating that under this when I situation where I believe the null hypothesis holds, the count splitting p-values are just uniform zero one, they're valid p-values. And by contrast, if I apply the naive method that double dips on either the full data or just the test set, my p-values fall below the 45 degree line, and so they're too small. In other words, the naive approach that double dips does not give me valid p-values. Well, I just want to close by um, thanking my incredible collaborators, um, Lucy Gao, who's now faculty at University of British Columbia. She led the, the first part of my talk on selective inference for clustering, along with Yu Chin Chen, who's a recent PhD alum, who's now a postdoc at Stanford. Um, Anna Neufeld, who's just graduating this spring, um, led the work on count splitting. Um, we also have collaborators at USC and Hopkins. Uh, these are the references for the work that I talked about. And um, I would be really happy to answer any additional questions. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, are there any questions from, from those who are here today? Audrey? Hello, uh, thank you for the talk. I was really interested in seeing how you can um, split the counts to, to get independent data. Do single cell is usually already sparse. If you split them, you have even less counts. Um, did you see that it was often a problem that you would lose too many genes because you increase the sparsity by splitting the count? Yeah, that's a great question. So if we think about, yeah, so like if we think about the structure of single cell RNA sequencing data, in reality, it has a lot of zeros more than is shown here probably. But if we think about what count splitting is doing, like on average, it's reducing the numbers in each cell by a factor of two. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's gonna make the numbers smaller and it's gonna increase the number of zeros. But I feel like that's an okay price to pay in exchange for valid inference. Because the point is that if I don't split my data into using this um, count splitting, then I'm just not gonna have results that I can believe because I've just you know, reused my data in a way that makes the statistical results invalid. 
And I, I would argue that splitting your data into, again, you're not losing half the genes, you're not losing half the cells, you're just like essentially splitting each count in half, although you're doing it in a, in a non-deterministic way using a binomial distribution. I, I think that that's an okay, in my opinion, an okay price to pay in exchange for valid inference. The, yeah, the reality is you'll end up with more zeros in your matrix, like this little two over here in the third cell on the first gene might turn into a zero. Um, but I guess I, I think that I think that that's okay. And of course, one thing about single cell RNA sequencing data is you have a ton of cells and you have a ton of, ton of genes. So even if you have some sparsity, we're still gonna see like correlation between the genes that are correlated and correlation between the cells that are correlated. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Adrian? Yeah, so thanks a lot for the talk. It's really interesting. Um, so the question I had, a lot of the examples you showed were comparing expression say, between two clusters, so two distinct clusters. and. Um, but say um, if you're focusing your analysis on one of those clusters you identified and say comparing between two conditions. So say, you know, between sick individuals and uh, healthy individuals, would that also fall under the double dipping category? Yeah, that is such a great question. So I, the way that I'm hearing that question is like, you know, in this cartoon, instead of comparing clusters 11 to 14, let's just look at cluster 11. And we happen to know that some of the cells in cluster 11 were taken from like a normal tissue sample. And then the, some of the other cells were taken from like a, a tumor tissue sample or something. And we want to test for differential expression between the, the normal versus the tumor. Was that your question? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that is a really interesting question. I actually, we, I, uh, last quarter, a grad student and I were looking into that question and we were kind of excited to think about that as a potential example of double dipping. And what was very interesting is we actually found that in that case, like just using your data twice was actually not that bad. Um, because the the point is you are using your data twice, like once to cluster and then once to test. But the thing that you're testing is a difference in expression between, you know, like tumor and normal or whatever in the example that I gave. And that's not the same information used for clustering. And so our empirical results are that in that specific instance, it's actually kind of not so bad that you've done double dipping. Um, so we, we basically went into that investigation being like, oh great, let's show that this is a problem and then we can write a paper about how to solve it. And then when we investigated it, sort of like in, in simulation experiments, we were like, oh, okay, it's actually like not so clear that this is really bad and it doesn't seem like a big enough problem that we need to like be losing sleep about it. Um, so that was that was what we found. But this is just like that's my very informal finding, and it would be interesting to see if someone's done a more careful analysis of that. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot. There's a question from Orshi. How, how does count splitting result in completely independent data sets? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's um, so you know we have the two flavors: we have the Poisson count splitting and the negative binomial count splitting. But we can just look at the Poisson count splitting. So this is just a like it's just a theorem. It's just something you can prove. Um, if you if you want to see a proof of it, you could look up like on Google binomial thinning for a Poisson distribution, and you know it's maybe like a I don't know a page or a half page of of math. So it's kind of hard for me to explain in words without writing out the math. But this is just like a property of the Poisson distribution that if you do this procedure to it, you end up with with two things that are independent. And probably for for our negative binomial count splitting, there's just a mathematical proof that makes it true. Sorry, Danielle. I had a bit of a follow-up question along oh. the same lines. If you had single cell data, but from, from different people, right? So do you need to thin each person uh, separately? <clears throat> Assuming that yeah. there's heterogeneity between individuals? Right, that's a really good question. Um, so you're saying that you're... So you know, I'm actually a little bit confused about the question because I would think if you have like 10 people, they each have 10 different sets of cells. And if I think about my count splitting procedure, each cell is getting thin separately. Like I'm doing count splitting to each element of the data matrix separately. So like if cells one through four are for person one and then cells five through eight are for person two. Uh... I'm assuming I that there's actually heterogeneity between the people due to their, you know, their their exposures or their ages or whatever. So, um, and anyway. so I think that if there's like heterogeneity among the people who led to the cells, I think that's something you should definitely think about 
when you are figuring out like how you want to identify latent structure in your training data, and also when you're deciding how to test for that latent structure in your test data, like I think it's definitely a good idea to think about the fact that the different cells came from different people, but the actual count splitting procedure does not care that your cells came from different people because count splitting is being performed on each cell individually. Oh, okay. So as long as we feel comfortable about this assumption, which is that like, you know, this particular cell is Poisson with some mean. Okay. Then we're okay. Yeah. There's a question, I think, from the seminar room. Do you want to, um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, yeah, I, I've got a question. Um, is there any, like, is the selective inference method uh, advantageous if you have it uh, over the count splitting? Uh, or is it just like un unnecessary work uh, for for no like for no yeah work? so that's a really good question it's actually um it's kind of hard to know even how to make a head to head comparison there so one way we can make comparisons is in simulation so we can like simulate data and we can say okay well if both approaches are going to give us you know like valid p values that are uniform under the null which one gives us more power under the alternative. And what we've found, because, you know, if, if, if both of them give you valid p-values, then we should just go for power. We're going to want just the approach that has as much power as possible. And what we found is it sort of depends on, like, how you've simulated the data, like sample split or count splitting. It, it does have a big bummer associated with it, which was mentioned in an earlier question, which is that we are going to end up, like, essentially just having half of our data for training and half of it for testing. But whether that's better or worse than fitting a model on all of your data and then sort of conditioning on the fact that you fit that model in doing your testing, it, in our experience, it is um, a bit, um, you know, sort of depends on the details. And we don't have like a theorem or a mathematical result saying which is better. Now, I'll tell you something that is just my off-brand opinion, which is that um, in my experience, selective inference, it, you know, makes this assumption of multivariate normality. But if multivariate normality doesn't hold, then I believe selective inference is basically okay. Whereas count splitting very, very much relies on my distributional assumption about the data. So like if Xij, if I assume that it's Poisson so that I can do this Poisson count splitting, but then in reality it's negative binomial, then I'm in bad shape because I get a lot of correlation between the training and the test data. And so you might say, okay, well, that's fine because on the next slide, I'm gonna show you my result for negative binomial count splitting. And like, yeah, like, great. But if I was wrong about it being negative binomial and instead it's something different, then again, I might end up with a bunch of correlation between training and the test data. And that's really why, like, which is better, selective inference versus count splitting? I, I have trouble giving you an answer because I think it depends. I think count splitting is a lot easier in practice. Like when I talk to my collaborators and I hear like, what problem do they actually need to solve? I'm not sure that selective inference is going to be like a scalable solution for them. Whereas I feel really confident that count splitting is scalable. Like I, you know, I have collaborators who just have like asked me for just like a little, you know, R function that just does the splitting for them. I mean, they don't really need it for me. We have an R package, but it, it's very easy to just like do that count splitting and then you're you're good to go. So on a practical level, I think count splitting is preferable. I see we're after one o'clock, but let, if do you have time for a couple more questions? I do, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, Dan and I. Um, yeah, hi. So I was wondering, um, for the cell splitting, originally the problem was mostly in the step where you transferred the cluster labels from one to the other, right. from training to test set. So wouldn't that still be an issue with the count splitting? Like, how do you Yeah, get that's such that? a great question. That's a really good question. So the reason that it's not is because if I look at this, my training data, my test data have the same dimension. So I don't ever need to like the thing that went wrong in count splitting is that in count splitting, it's like my training data only has cells one and two and my test data only has cells three and four. So if I cluster on cells one and two, I need a way to, to label those clusters on cells three and four. But the thing that makes count splitting different is that the exact same set of cells are in the training and in the test set. So if I cluster the training data and I decide that cells one and two are in one cluster and cells three and four are in the other cluster, I don't need to use the test data to decide which cluster each cell should be in in the test data because I already know. I can just oh, so port use... over those clusters. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, but that doesn't cause the same issue of kind of relying on clustering. No, because I don't need to look at the test data in order to decide what cluster the test cells belong to. 
because whatever clusters the training cells belong to, the test cells are in the exact same clusters. I see. Yeah, because the you. cells are the same in the training and the test data. And I think we're going to our last question, Yue. Right, uh, so thank you. Yeah, so actually the kind of similar to the follow-up question, I understand you cluster cells using training data and because the cells in the training and the testing are the same cells, so you don't have to cluster the uh, cells in the test data because they are the same cells. So I, I think uh, it's a very clever idea. So uh, there are multi-omic single cell data. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering whether you can uh, cluster cell using one omic and then test the uh, differences using the other omic. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, that question kind of relates to the idea of feature splitting, where like I talked a lot in this talk about why you can't do cell splitting, but a natural thing to think is, well, what if I split the features? So I put half the features in the sample in the training set, half the features in the test set, cluster the training, <clears throat> the data using the training features, evaluate those clusters using the test features. And, and you're describing right. the multi-omics framework, but if we think about it as just like one big set of features and you have one omics as the training set and one omics as a test set, then that's really the thing I'm describing as feature splitting. Uh, you know, I the reason I'm not happy with that is because I think it's answering just a different scientific question. Like the scientific question that you're answering is like, well, you know, are the clusters defined in gene expression data? Are they also um, present with respect to like a tax seek or something? Right. If a taxi right. is your second kind of omics, like that is an interesting question, like absolutely very interesting question. It's just a different question. Um, and it doesn't mm -hmm. answer the question of are the clusters that I identified on gene expression data, are they like more separate than you'd expect by chance on that gene expression data? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Thank you. I think we've run to the end of the questions. Um, so I will. I would like to say a huge thank you for a, a wonderful presentation that's just generated a lot of interesting discussions and, and thoughts and, and questions, um, and hopefully will generate uh, um, thought, more thoughts and discussions and questions from all of those who were here today listening as we go forward. So thank you again for a wonderful talk. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. Thanks everyone for the questions and the attention. Thanks, Daniela. Bye-bye.